Okay, well, thank you for uh, the invitation. So what I'm going to talk about is not just uh, dynamics, but maybe try to bring a little um, ecological principle into the study of dynamics in the context of the human microbiome. And obviously, uh, most of my work has been uh, centered on the human vagina. So I will bring uh, uh, examples um, uh, that are uh, de de derived from the our study of the dynamics in the human vagina. But before I start, I just also want to say that it's very important to, to understand that, especially when it comes to, to those principles, and I'll reiterate this later, that not, not every body site is going to be governed by the same principle. And I think we've, we've, we've seen this many times, uh, comparing uh, diversity, for example, across different body sites. And the, the vagina appears to be one of those sites that uh, appears to, be, to behave differently, with uh, low diversity being something that's good, uh, when in the gut, we just, we just heard low diversity appears to be associated with something bad. So that said, um, before we go on and, and discussing um, dynamics and, and, and so on in, in this ecological framework, we might want to start discussing um, a little uh, definition. So in, in the context of, of ecology, dynamics is only one of the most important central theme uh, uh, to study um, uh, microbial community uh, ecology. So. Um, the dynamics of microbial community can be, can be defined as a temporal and spe spatial changes in community structure as well as uh, or function. So every time we talk about change, um, this idea of stability comes along. And I know some of it might be a little redundant with what uh, David uh, just talked about, but uh, stability and instability has been defined extensively uh, in, uh, in ecology, but also um, with <laughs> quite a, a diverse set of views to it. In 1997, uh, those authors cataloged over 167 definitions of, uh, of um, uh, stability uh, just in the field of, of ecology. But pretty much they could summarize this, that stability encompasses three principles. Uh, one of them is this idea of resistance, or what we call also constancy, where a community pretty much is staying essentially unchanged over time, as well as resilience, which uh, David has talked about, uh, where a community can be disturbed but return to uh, a, a reference state. And the last one is what we call persistence, and persistence uh, it's when the community pretty much persists uh, in one ecological state uh, through, throughout um, uh, time. So one reason that um, uh, there's so many definitions of stability um, is um, certainly because they're not all asking, people using uh, stability are not at all asking the same question. But pretty much you can kind of summarize this by saying that stability, if you want, quantifies the extent to which a community stay the same. And I think that just simplifies a lot uh, uh, in, in for, for this work. Um, so stay the same over a long period of time. And of course, it depends um, on time scale. So if you're talking a lifespan, if you're talking a few years or a uh, decade, all this is going to change. And it can stay the same over time or in the face of some disturbance. And I think uh, David has um, touched on this uh, quite extensively. So there are many, many ways to, um, that, uh, by which you can measure different metrics that you have to, uh, to measure stability. And I, I listed a lot of them. And, and again, uh, might be redundant on what David just said, but depending on the, the, the metrics that you're going to use to uh, establish and define stability, you might get different answer. And you might have some community that appears to, to be stable given one metrics, but given another, uh, another metrics are somewhat unstable. And this was um, uh, just a paper uh, by Jeff Gordon's lab uh, recently that showed that by just introducing a probiotic, the community is not changing in composition, but its, its activity, its gene expression of the community is dramatically changing. So again, so it's very important the, in terms of the, the metrics that you, you can do. So either composition type metrics or maybe some more functional aspect of, of the community. 
And composition both include uh, doing gene survey to get to relative abundance, as well as uh, some of the work, for example, by uh, Dave Frederick in the vaginal microbiota that looks more at uh, specific uh, species qPCR, where you really get to true abundance of uh, some of the members uh, of that uh, community. So disturbance um, is another very important concept in, 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 in ecology, and it's linked to, to resilience. And uh, David mentioned, actually, the, the second part of uh, the definition of disturbance that I list here, where you can actually kill or displace one or more uh, member or population of a community, and that gives opportunity for other to take over uh, the space. But there's other part of disturbance. You can disturb a community by, for example, removing a nutrient, uh, changing um, a, a, a substrate of ability, or even the physical environment of that community will have an impact on community structure. So there's many ways you can have disturbance. And resilience, uh, of course, is the amount of disturbance that a, an ecosystem can actually uh, withstand without changing its self-organizing processes and uh, function. So ultimately, people think that a uh, community that have um, a fundamental difference in species composition and structure uh, uh, and function certainly will differ in their uh, level of resilience. So how can you kind of model this, um, all this together, uh, this, this concept of disturbance and resilience? So if you think about uh, disturbance, um, they can have certain level of intensity, they can have certain level of frequency and duration. And the combination of those two uh, really define the disturbance. A community resilience can be, if you want, defined by this threshold line here. So a community can be disturbed, can be, can be changing in structure or function, and stay within this space that's uh, defined by this, this arc here on this side. But as soon as the, the intensity and the frequency, the combination of those two, is high enough, the community can move into a disturbed state, kind of a, one of those other valley that uh, David uh, mentioned. So in the disturbance um, that uh, we talked about, uh, we, uh, they can be actually imposed by human, um, and that would be, for example, our hygiene, diet, behavior, antibiotic use. And if you want, it's, a, it's our life history. And all those disturbances are going to influence our, our community, our microbial community. But they also include normal uh, uh, biological processes. For example, uh, menstruation in women can have an effect. Uh, hormonal variation over a woman's lifespan actually can have major effect on the vaginal microbiota composition and its only function, as well as differences in uh, changes in uh, immunology, uh, your immune status uh, over time. So one thing we are uh, trying to understand is what are the driver of change and resilience in a microbial community? So in order to understand dynamics, we have to study community over time. We have to be able to sample a community over time. Uh, there's been many studies um, that have um, uh, done this, and those studies have, have shown some very, very important uh, uh, results and finding. But they've all fell short pretty much, uh, most of them, I would say, fell short very, uh, because they either uh, sampled um, very sparsely over a long period of time, or they sampled very few subjects very frequently. And the study that, for example, uh, uh, David mentioned uh, earlier are some, some of those examples. While they're very Im important in driving uh, hypotheses, it's very hard to generalize the finding to the larger uh, population. And really, the, the reason those were done uh, with those kind of study design is that uh, they were really limited by cost and feasibility of, of sampling, for example. So, and then here I just want also to say that um, some uh, studies that studied, for example, the gut, the principle that are derived might not fit, again, uh, what we might find and study, for example, in the, in the human vagina. And uh, the other thing is that it's very important, most of them actually looked at composition, 
And a lot of time, this, the composition analysis is done at very low taxonomic resolution, uh, often at the phylum class and order. And it's, I think it's very important, and especially in the human vagina, to, to go down to even lower uh, resolution species, and as you might see uh, later in the talk, uh, p uh, potentially uh, even strain of certain species. So now let's move and uh, move on and, and look at uh, the dynamic of the human vagina in reproductive age women. So we know that the vaginal microbiota is changing over time, quite uh, through a woman's lifetime, quite dramatically. But for this particular talk, we're going to be uh, focused on just the reproductive age period. So. Recently, we, uh, um, about two years ago, we published um, a paper that uh, defined uh, five different types of uh, vaginal microbiota. And I represented them on this uh, PCA plot. Um, five of those types, uh, four of those types, are dominated by one species of lactobacillus. So we have lactobacillus crispatus, lactobacillus sinners, lactobacillus gasseri, lactobacillus jensoni. And the fifth one, which has now been divided into uh, two group, actually define a community that does not have very uh, large number of lactobacillus and has a lot of uh, strict anaerobes. So this study kind of like, you know, highlighted first the importance of lactobacillus as potentially a keystone species in, uh, in the, the vaginal environment, but also that in, in asymptomatic women, we can also have community that uh, don't, don't contain lactobacillus. But this cross-sectional study did not give us any information on um, how a vaginal community can actually change over time, and even if it changed over time, or is it fixed in, in one time and it stay constant like we've seen, for example, uh, in, in the gut studies that were presented er earlier. So to address this question, we actually um, um, perform a, a study where we enrolled 160 women and we did what we call a prospective longitudinal study where we collect sample every day, in this case, uh, as women uh, go through their 10-week their period and we collect everything and hoping that certainly some condition will happen and we'll be able to, to study uh, whatever happened before, during and after all those different events that might happen in the, in the vaginal microbiota. So those samples were collected. We, 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 we had a study that uh, aimed at not only looking at DNA, but also RNA and also uh, metabolomics and, and proteomics as well for future use. Uh, we had very uh, extensive uh, daily diary and uh, a weekly visit at the clinic. We had clinical assessment at enrollment week five and week 10 of the study. And we did this study using uh, power sequencing of the V1, V3 region. So we did this study for 50, we, uh, we were able to generate data for uh, the first 50 women. And when you start looking at this longitudinal profile, we can kind of cluster them, if you want, into three main categories. The first categories are women who appears to be stably colonized pretty much by one species of lactobacillus. And menses, as indicated by those red little dots, they are the only event in those communities that tend to uh, uh, induce a change in the composition of the community. So in this case, it's Lactobacillus crispatus is, dominated at all is dominant at all time. In this case, in orange, is Lactobacillus inners who's dominated at, at all time. Then we have a second group of women, um, which I don't know if you can call this stable, but somewhat over time are colonized by a wide array of strict anaerobes, but contain very, very little lactobacillus. And you can see a little lactobacillus inners here uh, and none into this woman, but species that are actually been associated with, with for example, bactovaginosis, this large uh, green one here is Garnola vaginalis, this blue one is Atopobium vaginae. So, there is a measure that we call Nugent score, and I'll, I'll come back later to it, which was, uh, is, is a, a, a research tool that's used for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. And in those women, the Nugent score was pretty much very high, indicative of bacterial vaginosis the, the whole time this study was going on. However, those women did not report uh, uh, symptoms um, related to, to bacterial vaginosis and uh, did not seek medical attention. The third group of women had microbiota that changed constantly over time. 
very rapid changes. And you can see again the same color, red and uh, orange here is, is Lactobacillus inerus and crispatus. A lot of changes in and out of a little bit of Lactobacillus, no Lactobacillus, but very diverse type of microbiota. So we were trying to understand what drive this, this, those changes. And we were able to, to model uh, the, the change that we see over time uh, by modeling this, um, what we call the rate of change of this uh, index, the Jensen-Shannon divergence. And uh, if you want, it's a, an estimate of stability. And what you can see here is that during Mensee, stability of the community is very low, indicated by this high index, high rate of change. And as you go towards the mid middle of the cycle, community stability start to, is very much lower and stabilized. And then it comes back up and go up to being a little more unstable. If you map on top of this uh, estrogen level, what you can see is that stability of the community is associated with higher level of estrogen if throughout the cycle, the menstrual cycle, as well as uh, higher level of uh, progesterone. The factor that changed uh, dramatically the, the community stability were obviously uh, menses. So the time in a menstrual cycle was very important but as well as sexual activity to some extent, but not in all um, uh, uh, community backgrounds. So a certain type of community dominated uh, by different type of uh, uh, microbe tend to be more affected uh, by time, by sexual activity than others. So to just to give you an idea of how dynamic those communities are, we, we just put this little um, movie together. So what you can see here is a heat map that uh, shows uh, time on the x-axis here and the different taxa and their abundance with red being the highest, the higher uh, abundance here uh, over time. And what you can see here is this ball here represent the state of the community uh, where this red bar, this black bar is. And the black bar is gonna move and the ball is gonna move uh, into this uh, vaginal space which I described earlier. And so remember, this is over 16 weeks in this particular woman, and you can see how dynamic the community is. It's changing completely from being dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus to now dominated by Lactobacillus inners. It comes back here, and it's moving a little bit away from even having Lactobacillus, and it's coming back, and it's now gonna go uh, all the way to um, this community that does not contain much Lactobacillus. So what does this all mean? So if you look um, carefully, if you map on top of this tetrahedron that I showed you, this, this PCOA plot, we can see that, as I showed you earlier on this longitudinal pattern as well, is that this community state type four here that we call is associated with high nutrient score. So potentially, you know, this, this, this uh, tool that's used for diagnosing bacterial vaginosis, as well as high pH. So what does it mean to have high pH and high nutrient score? So when we look at this, we, we see that in, in about 25% of those uh, women in our studies are in those states that don't have lactobacillus, um, that are not dominated by lactobacillus. And those obviously have this high nutrient score and high pH, there's a strong association. So there's a pretty extensive literature that shows that when you have high nutrient score, um, and, and some, to some extent pH, there's a strong association with an increased risk of sexually transmitted infection, acquisition and transmission, included HIV, as well uh, risk in pregnancy uh, from preterm birth. So we have women here in this particular study which are asymptomatic, apparently healthy, but potentially are at increased risk of sexually transmitted infection and other adverse outcome. So how can you summarize all this? I think we can summarize this by saying that throughout uh, uh, those, those period, uh, throughout time, there are windows of higher risk to, for example, sexually transmitted uh, infection that open and close on a temporal scale. And how can you model this and how can you represent it graphically? Think about this community type four that's in the middle of this tetrahedron round that I showed you. Here, what I did, I, trace, I traced on this um, uh, uh, figure here the pattern of change of this particular community. Now, think of every time the line, the white line, enter this sphere, which represent that community state type four, this particular woman is at increased risk uh, 
of, uh, for example, acquiring a sexually uh, transmitted infection. Obviously, it's only if she's exposed to it. And now we have this woman, which I just showed you, which can fluctuate widely between different lactobacillus and enter this state only once, compared to this one who was almost constantly into that state. And then we have that third woman, which pretty much has not changed over time and stayed the white line just pretty much went over there. So what we have here is, 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 is a state um, that in, in gives a higher risk uh, to potential um, uh, adverse outcome. And we wanted to know if uh, this community stability and dynamics, so that's how we kind of like summarize it, that the frequency and the duration of this state actually might actually represent a better risk uh, to disease. So the resilience of the community, not just to lose, to, to go in, just to go into that state, might actually represent the risk. So a low resilient community, a community that enter that state more often, is at increased risk uh, than uh, others. So that's very interesting to know this, but I think still this is a, a huge gap. While, while we know that we might be at high risk, we still do not understand the underlying causes for this stability and this dynamic. And so we wanted to understand this at the molecular basis and look at a potential association between stability and, and this susceptibility. So we win this and we wanted to, to look at the correlation um, between the gene content of the community and the, the, that we have in different species, as well as community stability. And to do this, we perform a metagenomic analysis of um, a, a large number of, of, I think, 50 different samples, and we looked at comparing the genome of some of their member. We picked one of the member which we thought was very important, and that member is Lactobacillus inners. Lactobacillus inners is often associated with this state that we call um, bacterial vaginosis, as well as often associated with re, uh, frequent fluctuation. So by metagenomics, we can actually uh, very nicely uh, generate a, co a compositional structure of the communities, and you can see we have communities that have very low amount of Lactobacillus inners, some that have high amount of Lactobacillus inners, and some that have uh, 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 lactobacillus inners with other uh, type of lactobacillus. Some of those samples, which are in black, were sampled actually from community that had already been characterized longitudinally, and the sample in red were samples that were sampled cross-sectionally into a uh, certain patient. So the idea of sampling uh, those one that come from long, we, we're a community that are already characterized longitudinally is that we might be able to associate a potential genotype of lactobacillus sinners with uh, community stability. So by comparing all the genome of all those lactobacillus sinners, which we were able to reconstruct from the metagenome, we were able to construct this phylogenetic trait. And what this tree number one tells you is that Lactobacillus sinners is a very diverse species. It has a lot of different strains which genomically are somewhat different. Number two, we can now map onto all those different type of Lactobacillus sinners or strain of Lactobacillus sinners, those longitudinal profile. And when we do this, what we observe is that there are three branches on this tree that are associated with either instability, you can see the community going from inners dominated to lack of inners and so on over time. So those open and closed window of opportunity for infection, or you have lactobacillus inners uh, genome that are associated with uh, communities that almost where lactobacillus inners cannot become the dominant member. And then we have branches on the tree that are associated with a, a strain of lactobacillus sinners that belong to community that are extremely table, stable over time. And this is even more important if you think and start adding on top of this um, a little more metadata that we collected at the same time. And some of those samples, which are lighted in color here, and they shown here, those come from women who actually were diagnosed, where uh, came to the clinic uh, because they have chlamydia. So now we have an association of certain type of lactobacillus sinners associated with certain type of community that might provide a risk uh, 
And now we have those type of inners associated with the presence of chlamydia. So the drivers of community stability, we, um, we see that uh, there's different kind of lactobacillus inners genome that appears to be associated with community resilience uh, to enter this community state type four. And we can ask the question is, does this fragility, potential fragility of a single species in the community uh, could drive the entire community to go into a dysbiotic state, uh, dysbiotic state. Uh, and that state might carry risk to, uh, to disease. So we now have this hypothesis that uh, we uh, are testing, which we hypothesize that the vaginal microbiome, its stability and its dynamic, uh, meaning the frequency of duration of this community state type four, might be a better uh, representation of the estimate of risk to infection and that this stability and instability can be driven by the lack of resilience or fragility, if you want, or increased fragility of certain keystone lactobacillus uh, species into the community. So I just want to finish um, quickly, and I'm going to highlight the different gap and challenges that uh, I could come up with when it comes to, to studying um, dynamics and especially, I guess, issues related to women's health. Um, I think that we haven't really solved this question of uh, cause or effect of those changes that, that we see. So we really need to, to collect more sample prospectively uh, into longitudinal study. I think that uh, the, the time is really there. We have the technology, we have, it's cheap enough that we can do it. We can do those large study where we have a lot of sample uh, collected frequently and in a lot of subject. And so we need to better understand the driver of uh, dynamic instability or instability, uh, not just in disease, but also in health, because even in an healthy state, we can be at risk. And I think it's important to, to understand health a little better. And do this not only in reproductive age women, for example, uh, in, in our case, but also throughout a woman's lifespan. We need to understand what shifting microbiome means functionally. So, looking at both the role of the microbiota, but as well as the host. The host is still one uh, in the vaginal microbiota is, is really largely unknown. So we need to evaluate this, this dynamic using different measure than uh, just compositional measure, metabolomics, transcriptomics, both on the host and the microbe for transcriptomics, as well as the immunological status uh, of, of the host. We need to also expand our study to not just looking at uh, the bacterial component of the, the, the vaginal microbiota, but including phage and viruses as well as fungi. And all this needs to be used to develop predictive model of the stability and instability when a community is in what appears to be an healthy state. So, and those models needs to account for um, our different health practices, antibiotic use, um, hormonal replacement therapy, as well as behavior. And all this needs to be used to translate this information in better diagnostic, prognostic, as well as treatment. And um, moving uh, the treatment of um, a condition in, in women uh, towards more of a personalized medicine. And I think that the, the, this association, very strong association of certain strain of lactobacillus with women over time, I think really uh, calls for this more personalized medicine uh, to the treatment. And with that, I'd like to, to thank all the, my collaborators, uh, both uh, at uh, IGS here um, well, in Baltimore, uh, Larry Forney's group at the University of Adao, and uh, the clinical partners that uh, are essential to do uh, this kind of work. With that, i um, be happy to, well, no, I won't answer question. But. We have time for one question. Uh, hopefully somebody will over here. Jacques, I, I, I think you covered it, but, or I suspect that it's in there, but I, I, I really appreciate your last slide, except for the incredibly small font size. But the, um, the question I have is how much of the, the gaps that you're talking about would also apply to other systems? Could you just, you know, sort of talk a little bit about, I don't, I don't think they were just relevant to, to vaginal studies. Well, I, I think that um, most, most of those gaps uh, will, will will we'll deal with, can be uh, uh, addressed in other and, and apply to other uh, body site. I mean, the lifespan, I mean, Ruth, I think, made a good case for understanding uh, this through the lifespan. Um, using different omics technology, but not just looking at the microbe and the host, 
all this again applies to every body site, every disease that we can think of that's where the microbiota can, can have a role. And the translation, I mean, this is all we, what we want. This is where we're going. This is why we're doing this, this kind of work. It's to, to take the finding that we do and transform them in, into, translate them into better diagnostic, better uh, prognostic, you know, predictive tools, as well as treatment. So I think it's, it, they're all very uh, translatable to any body site, any microbiota. I just have a quick question about other factors that you didn't mention, like douching or frequency of partners, the number of different partners, or what, not just the number, but what those partners are like. There must be all kinds of other factors that affect the vag vaginal flora. Uh, absolutely, and um, you know, we, ha we have evidence now, you know, because we've been collecting sample prospectively, that um, we have evidence that a single sexual act can actually introduce not overgrowth, but introduce new microbes yeah. through semen. And those microbes can actually take over the community temporarily and uh, over a longer period of time. So no, you're entirely right. Douching is definitely an effect. I mean, we, Rebecca Brotman here published- Is it a good effect or a bad effect? Does it get rid of bacteria or does it introduce new bacteria, douching? I, I don't think douching introduces new bacteria. I guess it depends what product you use, but it def definitely has an effect on this dynamics and, and uh, the amount of change that you'll see over time after douching. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, and let's thank Jacques one last time. Uh, this is okay. The last speaker for this morning's session is uh, Rick Bushman, Composition and Dynamics of the Human Virum. Mm-hmm.